Welcome to Wizards, Warriors, and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Fires of the Dead. And I'm Michael R. Fletcher, author of uh, Beyond Redemption. I also am Rob Hayes. Uh, I wrote Never Die. And sometimes I write under the name of Dirk Ashton uh, and the with the Paternus Trilogy. Which is his real name. I feel I've just been introduced, so uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think he pretty much nailed everything there. I'm, I'm going to be Ben <laughs> Galley today, author of Chasing Graves. <laughs> we probably should also give our real names, since some people might be listening here for the first time. So, <laughs> Rob, <laughs> oh, I I like Rob Hayes, I suppose. <laughs> I'll be Mike? I'll be Dirk Ashton today, author of the Paternus Trilogy. Uh, Michael R. Fletcher, author of Ghosts of Tomorrow and somewhere between six and eight other books I can't remember. <laughs> Excellent. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about our publishing journeys to date, how we kind of started off, where we're at at the moment, and maybe a little bit of our plans for the future. So Rob, would you like to kind of kick us off talking about your initial sort of publishing um, things that went on with your books and how that has kind of progressed over time to where you are today? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to make it somewhat succinct. Um, it's, it's a long story, to be honest. But then... I want to hear it. So I... Um... <sighs> no, you know, it's, it's, it's a sordid tale. Um, no, anyway, uh, so I, I, I've been writing properly since uh, about 2010. Um, I, uh, and then I eventually sort of decided I had a, a trilogy that was... I thought good enough to be published, um, submitted it to a bunch of agents, got soundly rejected, so uh, self-published it. Um, that was the, the Ties That Bind trilogy, um, which uh, sold far better than I was ever expecting, to be honest. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a, bit of a, a bit of a surprise to me. That was in 2013. And then in 2014, I was... Uh, Picked up by an uh, independent publisher um, who, I don't, I don't fancy naming them, um, <laughs> and uh, screwed around, basically. They, uh, they spent a long time um, publishing uh, the books, trying to get them out, and then, and then delayed the follow-ups, and then didn't pay me royalties, and it was all sorts. It was an absolute mess. And then in... 2017, I took my rights back and self-published uh, all my books all over again, basically. Um, which is a nice quick way of pointing out the fact that I am now entirely self-published. So we'll get into um, Mike and Dirks in a second, but just quickly on that note. So when you took back your rights and self-published everything in 2017, what did you see as the impact of that? How many books were you uh, re-releasing at that stage? Um, at that point, I was re-releasing five, I think it was. Although uh, the, the, the independent publisher only ever published three of them um, and basically dicked around with, with the other two, released an a audio version from an unfinished manuscript of... of uh, where loyalties lie, um, which was an absolute uh, horror show. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever had uh, that sort of thing, I'd be like, "Oh no, it's it's not. That's not how it's supposed to be." Um, so yeah, I uh, I, I re-released my original trilogy, Ties That Bind, and then released uh, Best Laid Plans, which they had the rights originally had the rights to, but never actually published. Um, yeah, that was. In, 2017. Yeah. Long, long time ago now, it feels. So moral of the story is be careful who you are <laughs> publishing with, essentially. Uh, my moral of the story is don't touch uh, independent publishers with a barge pole, but <laughs> different people may have different opinions on that one. Mike, do you want to talk about your publishing journey, which again is a little bit different? Yep. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try and rip through this fairly quickly. So 2008-2009, I wrote a cyberpunk book called 88, which was me basically trying to write Snow Crash and failing badly. 
Uh, I spent two or three years shopping it to agents, got rejected by everybody, landed it with a, what they call a micro press, a really small Canadian publisher and sold maybe uh, 32 copies. Uh, my second book, uh, Beyond Redemption, sold to Harper Voyager in the US and worldwide. I got one of those nice fat uh, trad author um, advances, uh, stopped working a day job for a year. Uh, and then uh, in spite of amazing reviews, sales actually bombed so hard. Uh, there was z zero interest in the, uh, the sequel I'd written during my year off and the standalone uh, I'd also written during that year. Um, so I, the standalone Swarm and Steel that later sold to Skyhorse. Uh, absolutely no one, uh, not a, there's no publisher interested in the sequel to a book that bombed, weirdly. I, I don't know why, <laughs> I can't figure that out. Uh, but since I'd already written it, uh, I decided I would self publish it uh, because, kind of, why the fuck not? Um, and I did, uh, and that was really hard. Um, yeah, I learned a lot. But uh, that was it hard, if I can just jump in quickly. What? No, shut up. Uh, that <laughs> sequel was The Mirror's Truth, which uh, won a, uh, an art fantasy stabby that year for best self published author. Uh, book rather. Uh, anyway, so now you can jump in and interrupt now that I'm I'm done. Fuck. Thank you. So I was just curious. Why did, why did you say it was hard to go from traditionally publishing? Because well, uh, I didn't publishing. know what I was doing. I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know any artists. Uh, I, I was really new to social media, so I didn't know any other writers. I knew nobody um, at that point. Uh, I I had no idea how to self publish a book. You know, I was like Ingram, Amazon. Uh, at that point, it was uh, what the fuck was the one that did print? Yeah, Create Space. That's right. Create Space back then. It was bought out by Amazon, I think. Yeah. So I had to sort of do a print copy on Create Space, which was a pain in the ass, and then the digital copy on Amazon, which was a different pain in the ass. Um, so I, um, I learned a lot doing that, and sort of that made you know, the other books easier. Um, now, after that, I don't know how much detail to go into. Maybe we'll, we'll swing back to that later. I think I'm yeah, I think now. talking about early initial mistakes with our first indie books, that yeah. can be a good thing to pick up on later. Dirk, do you want to talk a little bit about your publishing story? Because you've been independently published from Gecko, right? Yes. Um, I mean, I started writing uh, the first book uh, in 2011, and I just did it to keep myself sane um, at that point. I found out I've always wanted to write novels. I used to write screenplays. I've written a lot of short stories. I tried to write a novel when I was 16, you know, that kind of crazy stuff, um, which I did finish and it's terrible. Um, but, and it's all handwritten, of course, because we're Whoa. talking about, we're talking about, you know, the late 70s. <laughs> the 70s yeah that's aging myself there but um uh i worked in uh i mean th this is relevant to the story because i worked in the film business for a lot of years including uh i was out in los angeles for a while and i wanted to be a producer and screenwriter and um and did did a lot of good stuff ended up making m most of my living as an actor but a lot of my friends did that kind of thing and i did have an agent the entire time i was there for acting and I know how the film business works, good and bad. Um, and uh, I also had a really good idea of how the publishing business works, which is very, very similar. And throughout that process, uh, I was uh, querying to get an agent for my screenplays, um, which never happened, even though my, my, some of my screenplays did get read by New Line Cinema and Scott Free, and I had a idea for a TV series picked up by, um, um, by American Zoetrope Television, which was Francis Ford Coppola's company, but it, it died in the hands of the, of the Canadian uh, financiers at that time. Fucking Canadians. Yeah, fucking Canadians. Um, 
they uh, <laughs> uh yo hosers um, <laughs> um so i had a good idea uh <laughs> but still <clears throat> once i had finished you know years years writing it was 2015 and i decided uh i had rewritten the book a number of times it was originally two books and I was like, you know, maybe I do want to publish this. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to. So I started doing some research and talking to friends and gathering some information and did a pros and cons. Should I try to query it or should I not? Should I go with traditional publishing? And even at that time, there was still a big stigma attached to self-publishing. If you self-published, you would basically be get blacklisted. You could never get an agent no matter what you wrote uh, again. Um, never for the book that you self-publish or the series you self-publish. Absolutely not. Publishers would not look at you. Um, that has changed significantly in the last five years um, where publishers are actually contacting directly um, self-pub authors and asking if they, them if they'd like a deal. I mean, we know several uh, people where that's happened and it continues to happen um so that stigma is gone so if that's holding anyone back don't let it but anyway so i i just i did decide to self-publish i didn't want to go through that query stuff um as a producer and marketing kind of guy i had learned a lot about you know production so the actual production of putting together and advertising so the actual day-to-day -day business of starting up a business of self-publishing, which is really what it is. You have to handle everything yourself. Um, was not daunting, though it was a very steep learning curve. Um, and I knew no one. I knew absolutely no one in the business. Um, so I decided to self-publish. And before I self-published, before my book came out, I went to the Confusion Conference, my very first writing conference. I had been to a lot of conferences um, in LA, uh, Comic-Con and Fangoria, and just, you know, every year I go to half a dozen because they have so many in California. Um, so I went to a conference, uh, just a small one up in Michigan. Great, highly recommended for anyone. It's more of a pro-con than a fan-con. And um, I just really lucked out and met some really great people early on. Um, and it was just about, you know, how to be basically how to be cool at a conference and not be too pushy, but still let people know who you are and meet people. Um, and I met Steve Drew, who started up our fantasy. And at that time, they had a quarter of the members they have now in uh, January 2016. And he got me an AMA. Um, he said, no, there's no way. But the more we talked, the more he said, you know what, I'm going to run it by the mods because you have an interesting background. Because I have a PhD in film. I wrote my dissertation about Lord of the Rings. Um, I worked in the film business. I've been in some movies that people know. So he figured there was enough there. Um, and it went really well for an early AMA. And I had only learned about Confusion because I had just recently gotten a Twitter and Facebook account. Um, and, and again, was feeling my way through this and was like, oh, look at these authors, like making fun of each other and having fun. I hope that I hope I can do that one day. Little, little did I know that I'd be, I'd be yeah. uh, locked into the cycle of horror with, with people like Michael R. Fletcher and Rob Hayes and all the you other guys. He's dragging you on a podcast. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and the then, you know, and, and the next year I got on some panels and I, I, did really well in the early in that SPFBO self-published fantasy blog off that Mark Lawrence runs um, and was a finalist and placed third. Um, Jonathan French, who won that year, was one of those people who actually got a um, an email that he didn't believe. He sent it to a few of us. He's like, I don't. Is this real? Do you guys know who this is? I mean, I've done some research and holy crap. It was the it was the um, the the editor. At, it was an editor at, uh, I think it was Random House, um, who had who had, the gray bastards, who had right? who had picked up who had picked up and uh, and edited The Martian, right? There we go. There's the book. Um, the gray bastards. And uh, and now Jonathan's a trad pub author because that's that's what he had always really wanted to do, 
with the Gray Bastard series. So these things, did, and those kinds of things would have been unheard of just a year prior, a year or two prior, absolutely unheard of. And the guy, that, that, that editor actually said, I will help you. I will put this out to agents and say, hey, I want this book. If you want to represent this guy, get back to him in 48 hours. And he was inundated and he got to talk to a bunch of agents and ended up going with a fantastic agent, actually somebody who I had met. Um, I had met her and she was great at, um, at uh, that, conf- that same Confusion conference. She was on a panel with Wes Q and, and a couple other people. Um, so I've just been, I've been really lucky. I'm really slow. My books are two years apart in, in, uh, in, in re-release. Um, and I think from a lot of what you're hearing here, the, the idea is just stick with it, stick to it, you know, and, and no matter what happens, I mean, think about it. Mike was querying his first book for three years. Um, and most people, stupid. most, most people, well, there's a fine line, all of us, right? There's a fine line between being tenacious and just being complete fucking idiots. And um, I think some, I, some of us managed to be both. I, <laughs> <laughs> tenacious idiots. Me too. So basically, that's kind of my story. I, I, I lose, I lose uh, track of my own conversations in my head. So, so just to date some things quickly. Um, Dirk, when did the first Paternus book come out for you? The first book came out May 1st of 2016, right in time to submit to the SPFBO. And yeah. I knew that was coming up, and I only learned about that because I had just joined Reddit Fantasy because Drew, I mean, Steve Drew made me join because I, had, I didn't even have an account at that time with Reddit, with Reddit Fantasy. And um, I'm super glad he did. Um, such a great guy. And um, I, uh, uh, then the second book came out in June, July, uh, June of 2018. And then the third book just came out a couple weeks ago uh, on July 10th. Okay. Or wait, no, July 23rd. July, or June 23rd. Yes. <laughs> It's out now. It's last been out month. For a yeah, last it's month. Out it's now. out now. Um, it's out now. And Mike, your first indie book came out in 2016. I'm not going to even think about the month. I think The Mirror's Truth was 2016. So good. I think uh, Beyond Redemption, the Harper Voyager one was 2015. And I, late, I think late 2016 was The Mirror's Truth. Okay. And Rob, yours first came out in 2013. Um, Sorry. Right? 13, 2013, I released all three books of The Ties That Bind on, I believe it was April 17th, 2013, <laughs> uh, which was a day like any of them, a dark and stormy <laughs> night. Um, Atmospheric. And then, yeah, they, uh, they got took off sale on uh, sometime in 2014 and then republished in 2017. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that because I think I approach this from like a very sort of different perspective than all of you three who are more established in the community. I only have two books out at this stage and my first book, um, Fires of the Dead, came out in September of 2019 last year. Um, And I definitely think it's interesting how we've all been talking about the different perceptions of traditional versus self-publishing and how that's evolved over the time because with this book, I was very much interested in uh, self-publishing it and just seeing how that pathway would kind of unfold. Um, Because like all of you, I'm sure I'd done a lot of research into both pathways. I'd sort of didn't have a particular stigma in my, no research, Michael's shaking his head. I forget, you don't do research. You just just go and and hopefully learn from mistakes. Um, But yeah, I think it's interesting because Mike, you talked, uh, Dirk, you were talking earlier about how um, you know, back in the day, there was more stigma attached to self-publishing and everything. And I suppose for me coming into it as a, uh, like more amateur author in 2019, I didn't really see that for me. So it was more, how can I test if self-publishing is going to be interesting to me? And that's why I didn't publish Across the Broken Stars, which I've been working on for, uh, like a year and a half at that stage. 
but I decided to write like a much shorter thing so that I could just kind of dip my toe in the self-publishing waters, see if it was something that I could like learn for, first of all, and if it would be kind of having the sort of results in everything that I wanted it to have. Um, and it did, and that's why I'm now sort of down the self-publishing pathway. So I definitely think hopefully through this podcast, we can kind of like have snapshots of authors at different stages in their journeys. I would say that most of you are like, well, established and advanced in the community i'm still much newer, veterans so. yes veterans that's the word We've, we have lost that, that new author smell we yeah, now have it. that old author smell <laughs> now, <laughs> you're quiet you're, you're quiet taste. i wouldn't i wouldn't describe it as old author smell it's something <laughs> entirely different a little must, must to it, you know yeah. you smell yeah. like old books that's definitely it yeah. that's a nice how about, old, have. how about old cheese well, yeah, there's a bit of a quarantine stench going on at the moment, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, need to open those windows at some stage. But hopefully, like through this podcast, um, for people out there who are listening to it right now, you're going to kind of get the perspectives of people who are quite experienced in self-publishing and people like me who are just sort of coming into it and going to make a lot of mistakes and hopefully learning new things. So I think hopefully that'll be a strength of having this kind of mixture of experience and everything um and with that it's time to segue into my shameless plug for this week because this episode's featured book is cross the broken stars by yours truly thank you for the clap thank you for the clap um which is a space fantasy novel set in a world where people live on these discs that float in space uh, and it's about a cowardly war deserter who's trying to seek redemption by helping this young fugitive search for a mythical safe haven that may or may not exist so this was my first uh, self-published novel and I had been initially tossing up whether to traditionally or independently publish it but after writing Fires of the Dead which is back there um, and self-publishing that as a novella a few months earlier I decided to go self-publishing and like the rest of you I think I am now committed to this self-publishing pathway for the foreseeable future. So we have about eight minutes before our recording runs out. Uh, I think if we have time, it'd be great to talk a little bit about kind of exactly that, our future, what we sort of want the rest of our publishing pathway to look like. Rob has a dog on his lap now, so I suppose that, that means you can start she talking woke about up. this first. I'm trying to <laughs> distract her from wanting a walk. I see. Puppy! Uh, yeah, so <laughs> just all got very distracted there for a second. Um, yeah, so derailed think, the conversation with a beagle. If we have time, <laughs> distraction beagle. If we have time, I'd be very interested to just sort of hear what your, um, for each of you, what your kind of like foreseeable plans are within publishing moving forward over the next couple of years, as much as you are willing or able to share, um, or just any other general thoughts you have on the topic of self versus traditional publishing. Mike, do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Uh, so for me, I, I mean, part of uh, what I faced is uh, part of my problem, one of many. Um, I originally defined success as traditional publishing. And so when I started, and for the longest time, uh, I saw self-publishing as a sort of like, you know, redheaded stepchild. Uh, that was failure for me. Um, that has changed changed as I've sort of uh, realized that I it's much better on my mental health um, the ability to write a book uh, hire an artist have control over the cover and put out something that I'm really proud of um, makes me a lot happier than waiting two years for rejection um, so in terms of future plans like right now I am loving self-publishing I got two trilogies on the go. Uh, but honestly, if a, if a trad publisher came along and was like, hey, we want to publish your book, uh, you know, here's a dump truck of money, then yeah, fuck yeah, I'm in. What about you, Rob? Uh, um, yeah, I, in some ways I kind of feel the same. Um, I, I think especially for when the sort of like the, the newer authors, there's still this very much the stigma of um, traditional publishing is is the ceiling you know and um self-publishing is sort of the basement uh 
or you get relegated if you're not good enough. And it's, it's not true. Um, but it's been there for a long time. Uh, and it's, I, I feel I think that sort of, that idea is still, still very much about. Um, whereas I think in reality, um, the, there are authors these days who could be traditionally published, who certainly have the, the sales for it. And I actually know a few who have even been approached by um, publishers and they've, they've turned them down. Um, there's a few reasons for that. I and mean, one of them can be uh, the creative aspect of it. You have more control over a project when you are self-publishing it. It can be what you want it to be. Um, whereas with uh, traditional publishing, you're a little bit more beholden to the, to the publisher. Um, you know, if, if they want something sort of adding in, you, you know, have to, to do that or at least consider it. Um, but then there's also a financial aspect, which is uh, for the lower and uh, mid tier, we'll, we'll call them tiers, uh, of, of publishers, uh, of authors even, you stand to make more money as a self-publisher than you do as a traditional publisher, uh, as a traditional published author. Um, because you get a much larger slice of the pie. Um, you know, uh, there are traditional published authors who have released the statistics of how much they get paid per book or whatever, and you know, some of them get like 15 pence per book sold or whatever. It's, it's, it's nothing. Whereas as a self-published author, you can be getting, what, a couple of quid per book sale. Um, sorry, a couple of pounds, very English there, quid. Um, that's what we call pounds in England because we're colloquial. Um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there's that to take into account as well. Um, if if you've got the the expertise and the the capital, uh, I suppose to to throw that you can stand to make a lot more from self-publishing uh, than you might via traditional publishing. Um, for myself, my own personal preferences, I would like to. Uh, do a bit of sort of hybrid personally. I would still like to be traditionally published, partly because having a publisher there to take the, the heavy lifting of certain things off my hand would be uh, amazing. Um, there's certain parts of the publishing industry, uh, self-publishing industry as well, that I find incredibly stressful and hate having to do. But you have to do it because I don't have a team behind me. Um, and there's also the fact that I feel that there is a still a very large portion of readers who you will never have access to as a self-published author um, because they just will not, uh, they'll either refuse to, to read self-published uh, work or they'll simply never find it because they mm. may be only shop style stores or, or whatever. Um, so I feel that you will find you, there is that portion of the of the readership of, of the market that you will be able to access via traditional publishing that you won't be able to via self-publishing. Uh, Dirk, we only have about a minute left before our recording runs out. But do you have any quick things about your kind of future publishing plans? Yeah, I I completely agree with anything those guys said. Um, uh, my next my next uh, I'm going to try the rapid release strat strategy. Um, four to six books, much shorter than the ones I've written. Um, and I'm gonna try to get, you know, a good number of them done before I release the first book. But by rapid, I don't mean as rapid as Rob. I mean one every three months, right? That's, um, that's doable. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't one, do maybe, like three books over two months, just don't. No, maybe one every three months, maybe even four or five or six. But for me, that's fast. Um, and uh, they be in the same world as Paternus, but I'm in the same boat as the other guys. If somebody came in, a publisher, and offered me a really good deal, um, I would take it just to be a hybrid publisher because, like exactly like Rob said, you you gather an audience that you just can't touch as a self pub, um, and you just can't get to. Mm. So I uh, don't want to run out of time. So, but that's kind of where I am. Yeah, and I think also that helps you kind of cross pollinate those audiences as well. If you have like one traditional published book, you know, maybe you get a fan from that who then reads your 13 other indie books. That's the whole, yeah, that's the whole idea. That's the whole reason to do it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's been a really great episode. Um, on that note, it is time to wrap 
this particular episode. Thank you everyone for listening slash, wa- slash watching. I ah, can't even pronounce my words. Uh, we will see you next time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Wizards, Warriors and Words. We hope you learned something useful. Let us know what you thought about this episode in the comments below. We'll do our best to respond. We'd also love to hear your questions. Comment with your questions below and we might even answer it on the show. If you haven't already, please subscribe and like this video. This helps more people discover the show. Wizards, Warriors and Words is jointly hosted by Dirk Ashton, Michael R. Fletcher, Rob J. Hayes and Jed Hearn, with editing by Jed Hearn. Our music comes from Michael R. Fletcher and our artwork is by Felix Ortiz. Thank you again for watching. Now go and write extraordinary stories. We'll see you next time.